Let's recall we are in chapter 28 of this journey that we've been going through called The Story, and we are almost near the end of it. Uh, we'll finish just before Thanksgiving. Uh, we moved past Easter last week. We move into the book of Acts this week and the birth of the early church. So we are in the book of Acts in our readings. Let's remember who wrote the book of Acts, the same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Luke. So he begins by saying, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. And then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Well, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Well, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs amongst the people. An opposition arose, however, from members of the, of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And so they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? And to this Stephen replied, You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. And when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And at this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. 
And meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when they had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You know, sometimes when you get right down to it, I think we are all in in between places. Yeah, some of you might say, "Sure, preacher, you know, we we know we know we're we're supposed to be Christians. We're we're aliens, we're strangers, you know, we we live in a foreign land. Our home is really in heaven." And, and yet, let's think about this. Each of us down in our lower stories, don't we often find ourselves saying, in the meantime, or, or at least for now, sure, lots of us are in this in-between time. And so we have to make adjustments that require rearranging our priorities because maybe we've just become empty nesters or we just became parents or grandparents or we've had a health crisis or maybe we've had a, a death or we've just lost our jobs. So, so, so friends, if you think you might currently be an in-between person in an in-between time, then the book of Acts that we just read, it's for you. Because as we arrive now at chapter 28 of the story, we find ourselves in this in-between sort of place. The book of Acts is a story that, that chronicles for us the passage of, of Jesus' followers moving from one era to another. It begins with this sense of in-betweenness. In chapter 1, the, the, the risen Jesus leaves his disciples and, and he ascends up into heaven, but as he leaves, he gives them a command and a promise. He says, Wait, and the helper, the, the advocate, the, the comforter will come. And so with, with this sort of fear and trepidation, the, the disciples, they, they wait in this in-between time. After all, let's remember, in the meantime can be a pretty mean time. And finally, there in that same upper room where they, they met with Jesus on the last night of his life, in that same upper room where he reappeared to them at Easter. Now as chapter 2 of the book of Acts opens, the one that Jesus promised, the, the Holy Spirit, comes during this Jewish feast of Pentecost. And suddenly, the disciples, they have tongues of fire dancing over their heads and they begin speaking in other tongues. There's electricity in the air and there's burning in their hearts. And because it's this big feast there in Jerusalem and, and the streets are packed with pilgrims, Peter gets up. And this guy who, who seemed to constantly suffer from foot and mouth disease Suddenly, he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he preaches one heck of a sermon. And, and yeah, he, he tells them the whole story that, that, that we have been talking about now for six months. And, and starting with the Old Testament, right up to their present time, he, he shows them that it was Jesus, that it was he who was their promised Messiah that they'd been waiting for, and that most importantly, they can now enter into a personal relationship with this Jesus. And they would now be able to do life with the God of the Old Testament. Imagine that. And guess what? That, that they could now do it without all these 
burdensome sacrifices and burnt offerings. And no more intricate rules. Now they needed to repent and believe and, and, and be baptized. And believe it or not, by the time that Peter gets done preaching, 3,000 Pentecost pilgrims get saved in one day. And so suddenly the church is born. And we move from this little band of Jesus followers following Jesus around in the flesh to what we can call the age of the Spirit. And no longer is following Jesus limited to having to be in his physical presence in this little country the size of New Jersey. No. Now by the Holy Spirit, Jesus can be everywhere. And, and doesn't that make sense? Jesus leaving this world, passing the baton on to the Holy Spirit, it had to happen if Christianity was going to be more than just this provincial little sect that was in some backwoods country. If it was ever going to be more than this, then this had to happen. So yeah, Pentecost comes and Things begin to shake and rattle and roll. And some who before were, who were deserters like Peter, they become these outspoken, single-minded preachers. And these previously frightened disciples are now performing some of the same miracles that Jesus had done. And there was this new sense of, of community between them as literally... They shared everything in common and they sacrificed for each other. And they even found themselves sharing the favor of their neighbors because of the amazing quality of the life that they were sharing together. And so we witnessed this, this man named, named Stephen filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's so on fire for Jesus that he becomes the first martyr of the church. We meet this dyed-in-the-wool, foaming-at-the-mouth legalist Saul. Having this literal come-to-Jesus moment on the road to Damascus as he's on his way to kill and to hunt down and to persecute Christians. And suddenly Saul becomes the Apostle Paul, who's commissioned by the risen Jesus in this vision to go to the uttermost parts of the known world at that time as God's mouthpiece to the Gentiles. And we see eyes opened and paradigms shifted as Peter and this non-Jew named Cornelius become the first odd couple. And thereby they open salvation to the Gentiles. Yeah, Acts. It's a book of transitions. You know, as the Chinese like to point out in their language, the word for transition has two Chinese characters. One character stands for danger, and the other for opportunity. So literally, transitions are times of dangerous opportunity. They're those in-between times in our lives. Say you're, you're moving from dry land in, 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 into water and such uh, dangerous, uh, muddy sort of places are places that can get you bogged down and stuck. Or they can also be places of opportunity where you can come out the other side into a new place where you've never been before. And that's sort of the story that we get in the book of Acts. Yeah, throughout Acts, we, we see these times of transition. The transition from the ministry of Jesus to the ministry of the apostles. From hiding out in fear, now to boldness. From the presence of Jesus to the presence now of the Holy Spirit. From the old covenant to the new covenant and from Israel as God's chief witness to the church 
now taking center stage. Yeah, we get to see their place of worship shift from the temple and from the synagogue to these little churches that meet in people's homes, from the Jews to the Gentiles, from circumcision to baptism, from the law to the grace, and from a focus on Jerusalem out to the rest of the world. Yeah, no wonder Acts is called the book of transitions because just as the gospel was intended to transform the heart, folks, it's fitting that the first book to chronicle for us this new life in Jesus should be a book of this sort of evolution, this passage from the old to the new, from centralized to decentralized, and from close-mindedness now to a time of free thinking. You know, as we, we sort of think about this revolutionary period, this time of transition and, and change, let's pause. And I want us to recognize today a strange coincidence because what is this Sunday in the life of a lot of churches in this area? Yeah, th today, a lot of churches that are Reformed in nature, uh, Lutherans, Presbyterians, as, as well as those who actually use the name Reformed, they are celebrating today the 500th anniversary of something called the what? The Reformation. My, my old homeboy, <laughs> Martin Luther, could no longer abide the greed and, and the corruption that he was seeing in the Roman Catholic Church of his day. And so on October the 31st, 1517, 500 years ago, he wrote what came to be called his 95 Theses, and he nailed them on the door of the Catholic Church there in Wittenberg, Germany. And the rest, as they say, is history. For so was born the Protestant Reformation. Protestant meaning those who protested what was going on in the Catholic Church of that day. And Reformation meaning a, a time of transition, just sort of like what we saw in the book of Acts when a revolution, a, a reforming takes place. So just as 2,000 years ago at Pentecost in the years that followed, so, 500 years ago, yet another time of transition and transformation took place. Because ultimately, as we're going to talk about today, there is always a need amongst God's people for reformation. Okay, preacher, you know, I, I get that part of your sermon title today. The, the Reformation story still continues, but... but what about the other part of the title you have listed today? The, that question, is the church still good for Christianity? I mean, what kind of a question is that? Of course the church is good for Christianity. That's what the book of Acts is all about, isn't it? Besides, you know, I've gone to all this trouble to, to get myself up and, and to get my family dressed and to drive here to church, and then, then the preacher goes and asks, is the church good for Christianity? I mean, that would be like hearing the president of the local Teamsters asking, are unions good for labor? It would be like, you know, hearing the speaker of the house ask, is Congress good for government. Yeah, of course. Of course the church is good for Christianity, isn't it? And yet I want you to consider some disturbing facts. Let's take Dan Kimball's recent book about insights from younger emerging generations. It's titled, They Like Jesus, but Not the Church. Or how about the Jesus Festival a few years ago where a college kid was seen carrying around a sign that read, Jesus, yes, church, no. Yeah, is the church good for Christianity? Not to mention, you know, some of the fastest growing 
youth movements in America are non-church related. Encouraging youth participation in the group, but not always leading to participation in a local church. Then there's the popularity of the TV and the internet, internet preachers, these slick kind of communicators drawing these vast followings, but many of whom give little or no support to any specific congregation. And given the fact that, that so many people are now giving their loyal support to, to such non-church movements, let's ask it again. What kind of a job is the church doing for Christianity? Well, a sober critic by the name of Soren Kierkegaard said it way back about 150 years ago. He said, whereas Jesus turned water into wine, at times the church has succeeded in doing a far more difficult miracle. It has turned wine back into water. So let's go back to the book of Acts now. Sometimes, you know, it's the nature of a movement in the vibrancy of its beginning to proclaim to the world, come and, and, and help us build the dream. But over time, slowly, its message drifts and shifts to come and help us maintain the monument. So for instance, in the opening verses of Acts chapter 1, Jesus proclaims to his disciples before he ascends up into heaven that after the Holy Spirit comes that they are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and, and then in Judea and, and then in Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And yet several years later in Acts chapter 8, because of Stephen's martyrdom that we spoke about a moment ago, God has, has to cause this persecution to arise just to get the Christians to, to move their heinies out of Jerusalem and out into Judea and Samaria. Let's listen to what we read this morning. And on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Yeah, a year ago, you may have heard me compare a pile of fertilizer piled up in one place to this situation. Because, yeah, it burns a hole in the ground. But when it's spread out, it does a lot of good. And that's sort of how God sees us as the church. We're in need of constant remolding and reformation, of being kicked out of our comfort zones because we tend to pile up in one place. But spread out, we do a lot of good. So by the time the book of Acts ends, folks, the church is now about 30 years old, and there's this all too familiar phenomenon that's beginning to become evident. But because it seems that the stronger the church became, the, the more hidden became Jesus inside of it. And folks, how do, how do we explain this phenomenon? Let's recall that there was never a time in the history of the church when it was more vigorous, when it was more alive than those first difficult years when it was being persecuted on every side and when it was struggling for some structure and it was hungry for new followers. And yet as the church grew stronger and as it gained a larger following and it gained this measure of respectability and as it became well organized and set up clear rules of conduct and procedure as they did all this the Jesus for whom the church was called into being started to show the first signs of receding into the background 
In fact, this progression would culminate just a few centuries later when the Holy Catholic Church became the absolute ruler of all of Europe with its power matched only by its corruption and Jesus Christ hidden completely behind its structure. So basically what we slowly begin to see unfold in Acts is a process that takes place in every human endeavor. As I mentioned before, the tendency of the organization to become more important, the cause for which it was founded, the tendency of the vessel to try to outshine its contents. And no matter how Christ-centered it was in the beginning, the church and its organization started to become more important than the Christ it was created to serve. And let's realize that this is a group dynamic not limited just to the church. Let's go back to the labor unions that we spoke of a moment ago. In 1982, the labor movement in the U.S. that celebrated its 100th anniversary, and it had already declined by then from 40% of the working force just 20 years before to 20%. And a few years ago in 2013, a little over 30 years later, it had dropped to about half that amount again. Because of some critics within the union movement have even claimed themselves the union and its maintenance became more important than the demands for equity and justice it was formed to champion in the first place. Yeah, any human endeavor is subject to the same dynamic, and you notice that I use the word human. Because what begins as something divine can descend due to our free will into something far distant from what it's set out to be. Luther discovered that 500 years ago. And maybe we have to discover that today. And are there symptoms that we need to watch out for? Let's consider these. First, the church is bad for Christianity when it becomes so locked into its old ways that it refuses to change. Yeah, it's, it's good for Christianity when it not only permits but reaches out for constructive change. I mean, after all, had those early Christians in the book of Acts not been willing to, to radically change their own religious faith, there never would have even been a church today. In fact, I sometimes wonder, in a bit of fantasizing, what would happen if, if we were somehow all picked up and set back down in 33 A.D.? Would we be open enough to change to become followers of Jesus ourselves. It was this radical step to take back then, moving from worship in the temple to worshiping in people's homes, from welcoming Gentiles into the church as believers and abandoning all of your old Jewish customs that were so long held important. Yeah, the church flourished as long as they were willing to change. But as the organization slowly became more important than its message, change became more difficult. There's always, folks, been in the church, those who see the church as a club, with a clubhouse, not to be disturbed, for members only. And when change comes, as it inevitably must, there are always those who make lonely pilgrimages, moving from one church to another, in this, fertile, this kind of fertile and futile search for yesterday's world. And yeah, folks, we today, we're facing so many challenges in our world that require that either we be open to creative changes in how we operate or else we die. 
I mean, can the church pretend that nothing ever changes in the challenges that it's facing today? Does it devise new strategies and methods for presenting the gospel to the degree that we are willing to change as needed? The church is good for Christianity. But secondly, a second symptom, the church is bad for Christianity when it's unwilling to assertively search for and assimilate new members into its midst. I mean, on, the, on the other hand, yeah, it's good for Christianity when our doors are open and new people are constantly streaming in. And as we as a church have reached out more and more over the last year into our community, we are seeing this very thing happen. And let's recall that this was one of the first crises that those early Christians faced together. Sure, they, they had arranged all this rather nice kind of church for themselves there in Jerusalem. There was a respectable number of members in their midst. The organization was set, and the apostles were all in control. And suddenly, a, a, along comes this new Johnny-come-lately, Paul with all these crazy ideas, and he wasn't one of the old boys' network. It was awful hard to accept this guy. But then, reluctantly, they did by sending him way up north to do all the preaching that he wanted to do up there. <laughs> but then way up north turned out to be Asia Minor and Europe. The, the Gentile world. And soon Paul, he had more converts in a dozen churches than there were in all of Jerusalem combined. Yeah. That's where the future of the church ended up being. Up north. So to the degree that the church reaches out to new people, the church is good for Christianity. How about one last symptom? Folks, the church is good for Christianity when it helps us to move from being takers to givers. Too often these days, you know, folks out in the world, they see the church as a place that wants to know what can you out there give to us? But our message must be to them, how can we serve and give to you? And in short, folks, we, we begin in the faith to use the church as a place for making our faith strong. We take. But then as we grow, we allow God to use our lives for the purpose of making the church strong. We become givers. And amidst this fall season, probably like me yesterday, a lot of you, you spend your weekends watching your football teams play football. And as vigorous as that sport is, you know, really our going, it doesn't really add a hill of beans, does it, to our own physical health? Because basically, folks, let's realize that a football game is 22 persons desperately in need of rest, watching 60,000 people badly in need of exercise. <laughs> yeah, we go to the game to watch good athletes performing at a level of physical conditioning which we will never achieve, and yet is that the purpose of the church? Do we come here to watch religious professionals performing on stage. No. If we do, God help us. The church is supposed to be a participation sport. And worship is a verb. And when the worship ends, the service begins. Yeah. The church is good for Christianity if you, through it, find Jesus Christ touching your life. Does it lift you up when, when you're having a bad day? Does it guide you when you're without a purpose? 
And does it give you a sense of the comforter, the Holy Spirit in your life when you're lonely? Does it give you hope when you feel discouraged? Yeah. But does it also make you examine your old prejudices in the light of Christ's love? And is it helping you to grow and to live and to act more like Jesus? Folks, that's what made the church in the book of Acts so compelling. It's Acts. People were being transformed from takers to givers. So when today's church doesn't act like that church, is it any wonder when we flounder? Well, you know, a few years back we were on vacation out west, my wife and I, and I found this detective novel and I picked it up and I started reading it. And several hours into it, I found that somebody had torn out the last chapter. And I never found out how the book ended. Never found out the solution to the mystery that's pretty much how the book of Acts concludes. Was Paul ever released from prison in Rome? We don't know, at least not in that book. Was he persecuted there? We don't know. What finally happened to the church? We don't know. Because the book concludes not with the end, but with a to be continued as we now continue our seven-month jaunt through the story. The next chapter in the book of Acts continues today through your life and mine, through our acts today. The story of the church continues. And by what we do with this church here in Douglas, Michigan, that's been given to us, we give our own answer to the question, is the church good for Christianity? Pray with me. Father, we have so much to learn from the book of Acts, from the vibrancy of something that begins anew, as well as what can happen over time if that which is divine becomes human. Help us to be your church today. And if we need reformation, help us that we might be your church in 2017 in Douglas, Michigan and all of God's people said together.